Okay, so um, since we're so, so few of us, um, would you mind terribly if I, first of all, do how many is here does not speak Swedish? Oh, there's one, two. Okay, good. So we'll do this in English. Three. <laughs> so um, since there's so few of us, um, uh, who's in here who's doing enterprise software or line of business software? So it's pretty much all of you. That's very interesting. So um, this talk is a little bit multifaceted. Uh, I will talk about in-memory databases, but I will also talk about how it changes the way we produce line of business software, or how it potentially can make us, um, uh, and also how it can actually affect the economy and the way we make money on enterprise software. Um, I'll start by talking a little bit about the, the background of, of, of in-memory databases. How many here has experience with in-memory in databases? Oh, good, that's good. So in enterprise software, there is, how many here has heard of the cap theorem? Good. So in enterprise software, we tend to want, by default, consistent data, right? We deal a lot with money, with inventory, and resources. So for those of us who's been trying to mimic the success of scale-out architecture, we've been struggling a little bit. Uh, how many here has been playing with, with scale-out databases, NoSQL databases, MapReduce? So this is how it feels for me when I'm doing um, scaling out uh, enterprise software data. It's, I can't really repeat the success of my peers doing Facebook, doing Twitter. And, you know, you know, am I doing it wrong? Why can all the other guys make this work and not me? And if we be skeptical for a moment, and maybe it's not the way scale-out works for, um, for us in particular, maybe it's the way scale-out works with consistent data. Maybe there's a simple way. Um, so when we scale out, you can just simply say 50% of the things we do becomes better, faster, and 50% of what we do becomes a nightmare. And those 50% is the things that doesn't actually improve with scaling out. So if we first look at what does scale out, we're going to see like Facebook is a perfect example. We read the data we enter into the system is not data we've read somewhere else. It's data coming from our minds and our heads. So it's consistent by default, right? There's no way it could be inconsistent because it doesn't originate from any data we read from the system. And what does not scale out? Well, this is, a, this is my favorite example of what doesn't scale out. We have three poker accounts. There's money. And one player is losing money to the other player. The sum of this should always be 100, right? We're just transferring money. This is a perfect example of what cannot mathematically be scaled out. We can't, the more computers we add to this problem, the slower, the, the less throughput we get. And it's quite simple, right? Because cause and effect needs signaling. And signaling is bound by the s speed of light. And we, we encounter this in our everyday life, right? We, when we go, um, I mean, if we want to transport stuff, we could just buy more cars. But if we, if we are, when we're transporting stuff, we first need to get grandma to uh, pick up her keys to the summer apartment, and then go keep pick up grandpa, and then go pick up the kids. Then, no matter how many cars we, we buy, we won't do it faster, right? So it's nothing wrong with us as doing business software. It's just that um, uh, it doesn't scale. And we've all been suffering from, from this not all, but many of us have been suffering from this by, well, you should scale out anyway. You know, I don't, I don't care it doesn't work, we need to scale out. But if you combine cap theorem with relativity, the speed of light, you're going to have the problem. And the cool thing now is we've been saved by the same guy who told us to scale out, Jeff Dean of Google. This is his statement now, not very often cited by uh, the NoSQL community. This is the guy who brought us MapReduce in 2004. This is what he's saying now. Um, and the cool, um, why he's saying this now, why this is happening now, is because there's a drastic change in, in computer evolution. 
we've, we've been so used to getting more and more speed that we failed to notice that something drastically changed around a few years back. And for the enemy here playing a Counter-Strike or any online game? It's only me. Ah, bollocks. Um, latency today is the same it was 100 years ago. The ping, if you're playing with friends in the United States, is going to be 200 milliseconds. It was the same 10 years ago. And it's not going to improve. Uh, um, and th the reason is we are already at 75% of the speed of light. So even if we had a straight line, which is not a really possible, and if we had vacuum, the potential improvement is just a few percent. And this does not affect when you don't need to scale out, as when don't you don't need consistency. But it will affect our kind of work. So what we at my company set up to do was to see how can we embrace this and ev um, make something better respecting the, the, the laws of physics. So our thought was that this is how computing used to work, right? Where you used to have uh, s uh, primary memory and secondary memory. And many believe we have primary and secondary memory mainly because we want to persist things. When you turn off the power, you want data to be there. But in enterprise software, we know we can't rely on, on a disk. It's not persistent. It can crash at any time. You need redundancy to be, be persistent, right? And that scales out beautifully. You could write it hundreds of places at the same time, right? So persistency is not really the problem. The problem is cost. In 1972, 3, 74, when Oracle was uh, produced as the first modern uh, relational database, uh, one megabyte of RAM was $170,000. So with inflation and everything, uh, an iPhone would be a billion dollars. So we had to have these mechanical engines rotating, spinning, big uh, magnetic disks. Just a few years ago, all of us in this room had it in our laptops, primitive electrical engines spinning uh, mechanical disks. But we don't anymore. Nobody in this room has probably... I won't say nobody, but most of us doesn't have it anymore. So we have something that is fast, uh, but we still haven't changed our architecture. We're still moving data from secondary memory to primary memory, only now it's the same memory. If you have your MySQL or wha w your enterprise database, chances are your cache is bigger um, than your data. In fact, Amazon.com, their, tra their transactional data, their stock, their inventory, their order lines, the products, it's 56 gigabytes per year. It's easy to calculate because the, the price of a book is around $10. You take the revenue, divide it, you see how many order lines you've got. The problem is that moving is super slow. And even if we're moving one centimeter from RAM to RAM, from your, uh, from your H2 database to your Java heap, or from your um, NoSQL database or your Oracle database to your Java heap, it actually travels a few kilometers because each clock cycle of logic, your local host, your, your TCP IP stack, and even, even if you're not using your TCP IP stack, the travel through the cycles is enormous and the data is going to end up where it started. So if you do A equals new person, that per or uh, sorry, A equals select person from persons where um, city equals Gothenburg. That information is going to travel from your database to your Java heap around seven kilometers. And we must ask ourselves, what if we, if we want data consistency anyway, because in line of business we want consistency data, why do we still treat secondary memory and primary memory the way we did 40 years ago? What changes the most often? Is it the code of the application or is it the data? And of course, the simple answer is the data can change a thousand times per second. Uh, whereas uh, your software, hopefully, even if you do continuous delivery, doesn't change more than once a day, right? So you have to ask yourself, why are we traveling the data instead of the code? If the code, if the data changes frequently and the code infrequently, why don't you do, why don't you do the inverse? Why don't you have the logic 
just um, execute where the data is. And in fact, uh, a, modern, a modern PC has 100,000 MIPS. That's 100,000 IBM um, um, 270 computers back in the Oracle days. That's 100,000 computers. There's 17 instructions per human on Earth for every second in a modern computer. Because and why? Because it's shrunk, right? We have, we've shrunk and shrunk, or Intel has shrunk and shrunk the the the, uh, the physics, so it's become ridiculously fast, right? We've got picoseconds to do a transaction, and there's a th there's a thousand picoseconds to a nanosecond, and there's a thousand nanoseconds to a microsecond, and there's a thousand microseconds to a millisecond, and we consider millisecond being fast, right? That's a million picoseconds. So what we set up to do is we said, well, we don't believe in primary and secondary memory. So what we, what, we, what, um, what we think is that if I do A equals select something from the database, I don't need to do anything. It's just a pointer, right? Because it's already there. It's already in memory. Why would I move it to memory if it was already in memory? So if I do person A equals new person, I want to persist it. Why would I persist it? It's already there, there, right? So as long as I can make the memory transactional, one, because we need transactions, we, we, need, we don't want half-finished changes, we don't want people to see changes that are not yet committed, but as long as I have transactions and persistence, I don't need it. I don't need to, to persist or unpersist. And persistence is very easy to, to achieve in computers, because computers have already, or CPUs, have virtualized memory. So you could secure to, th to 10 disks, 20 disks, 40 disks, continuously. And you're not moving, even if it's a mechanical disk, you're not moving the, the arm of the disk. Yes, look at a, a consumer camera. You could store 10 gigabytes a second, not on a consumer camera, but on a high-end camera, if you're filming. So you, the, th the bandwidth is enormous. And imagine if your business database drew it 10 gigabytes per second. No, it would be a lot bigger than Amazon.com, and it doesn't. So, but the main benefit is not that. Many believe that the main benefit is the simplicity. And how am I doing for time? 50 minutes, right? Because I'm terrible at time. Yeah. So many believe that that simplicity is the, is the main benefit of, of in-memory technology for business application. And that's kind of true. And my best example of this is, let's say you're to build a Facebook, and the specification is there's two users and one message per day. How many data centers, how many developers, how many teams would you need? You probably pick up Excel and say, I'm done, right? And this is what happens with, with power. You can do naive programming. And I'm, I'm going to show you that. It's, I think this is an eye-opener. Um, what do I mean by naive programming or collapsing the stack? This is my favorite example, and I actually have it here. And I know this is a Java conference. You're going to hate, hate this demo because it's a C-sharp demo. But I'm going to do it anyways. So this is a simple application. Oh, you can't see it. As soon as I switch from, let's see if I can hear. Ah, good idea. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, mirror displays. Kachung. You can see the rest of my junk on my computer here. So it's there, it's like this. Okay. So what we have here is the simplest of um, of business application. I'm adding an invoice here. Uh, sorry, I need to start the application first. Give me a minute. Turn the browser. So I'm adding an invoice, a Coca-Cola. One, another row of Fanta. So nothing special. But if you look at the code here, you're going to see 
some differences from the architectures you're used to. And you're especially going to like it if you're a friend of functional programming. Um, so I'm not going to bother too much about the HTML. This is an HTML page. You can't see it because scaling is terrible, but it's, uh, it's simply some tags with data binding. How many have used uh, Polymer or Web Components? So uh, how many have used two-way two -way binding libraries like Angular or Knockout or, or Polymer? So basically what that this is is a declarative style. You simply say that this element corresponds to this piece of data, so you don't have your jQuery code go in and imperatively change stuff. It's all, it's, it's all very declarative. In this case, this is an HTML screen using Polymer. You could use other libraries. And you can see there on the, no, you can't, but you have to believe me, there's a total there. It says total equals the total of this JSON document. And the JSON document, in its turn, are bound to database. And this is where it starts to be different. So you, you can see here, there's no imperative code. This is functional programming, right? But it's not functional programming in Haskell or something that is not really familiar to us as developers. So I say the total equals the quantity plus the price, right? So one Fanta at ten dollars, or two Fantas is ten dollars is twenty dollars, right? Or the sum of all the rows will be the sum of the order or the invoice in this case. So let's go back and see how that works. This means there's no code, there's no APIs involved here, right? There's no there is a REST API, but the, I, I, as a programmer, didn't create it because I told what the logic I wanted was. The REST is inferred by the computer, right? Because this is how you become productive. And the computer cannot make an error here because we declared that this is the relationship. So if I add a row, if I remove the row, if I cancel the changes, it will always be correct. There's no event to catch when you hit the when you change the quantity to remember to update. And, uh, and because of the speed, Every time I hit the key, I redo all the queries. I run all the queries. This is what I mean by naive programming. The speed is actually not making the program go faster. It's making us program in a different way. And this is the takeaway when you think about, when, 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 develop, when people speak about speed improvements with RAM databases. It's, it's not really about that. It's about you can do naive coding. You code like a three-year-old. You know, you don't think about caching, cache coherence, architecture. And it's very hard to make bugs in this way. And it's super fast. And faster is often misunderstood. We also think about faster as a way, why would you need faster? I'm an old programmer. I was born in 1970. And I've heard this question since I was seven years old, that computers are now fast enough, right? We don't need speed. And it's very, if you na argue in a naive way, it's very easy to understand this. I mean, I was playing Pong at that time, and why would I need the ball to move faster? What would the purpose be of the ball moving faster? It was fast enough. Little did we know when we got the performance, we would do World of Warcraft, Counter-Strike, or Facebook. And this is what happens. When you got the power, then you come up how to use it. When, wh when I was a kid, we had modems, we had, we had, we didn't have internet, we had CompuServe, but we didn't, you know, we didn't know what to do with it. It wasn't until like 10 years later, we said, okay, well, let's connect hypertext, which was invented in 1945. Let's connect hypertext with, with the internet, which was invented in 1962. And wow, you could use the power to do something new. This is what was, hap was going to happen now when the mechanical drive is fading in our memories. But this is not the, the, the coolest thing, because this is not actually the reason why we created uh, the StarCounter technology. We had a different purpose. We actually needed the power for something totally different. And we call this thing, and this is currently in Alpha. We have a few partners working with it. Uh, we call it the Information Operating System. And I'm going to see if I can get the sound here working.
each other. Star Counter allows apps to interoperate even though they've been developed separately with no knowledge of each other. At first glance, apps are Star Counter allows apps to interoperate even though they've been developed separately with no knowledge of each other. At first glance, apps are just normal business apps using familiar stuff such as HTML5, JSON and your favorite programming language. Instead of moving database data to and from the app, we do the inverse. We move the app to where the data lives. In Star Counter, all data lives in a single chunk of RAM memory. Everything is inside this chunk. The database, the apps, the view models, everything. This makes apps perform ridiculously fast. Because everything is concentrated in a single chunk of RAM, we can begin to do things that would otherwise not be possible. We call these things mapping and blending. Using mapping and blending, we can make multiple apps behave as if they were one. This allows you to access the best features of each app, as if they were all part of the same app. When mapping and blending is turned off, each app works isolated from the others. This is how the apps were written in the first place. Apps are not aware of each other. When mapping is turned off, every app has its own chunk of RAM. Again, everything lives in this chunk, including the database and the app itself. When the user is interacting with the app, the chunk updates. This often happens keystroke for keystroke and mouse click for mouse click. The magic happens when mapping is turned on. When mapping is turned on, the database of each app is virtualized. The app still believes it's operating solely on its own database. But now this database is an emulation. The actual data is stored in something we call the star counter shared storage grid. This is all achieved using a mapper. The mapper mirrors information between the shared storage grid and the virtualized database. A default mapper is provided with each app, but mappers can be replaced without touching the source code of the app. The shared storage grid is a dynamic, super fine-grained storage space that contains individual pieces of information, such as a person's age, a name of something, or any such conceptual aspect. When the user interacts with the app, the data is reflected from the virtualized database to the shared storage grid. Because of this, it's also reflected in all other apps through their virtualized databases. This happens in real time for every user interaction, again, often down to individual keystrokes and individual mouse clicks. On top of it all is the visual blending. Blending means that the widgets of all the apps are mixed onto the same page or screen. The effect of all this is that the user can have best-of-breed apps working beautifully and seamlessly together. You would have... Um can you hear me? Yep. So in a traditional uh, um, application, you would use um, microservices or web services as the means of integrating apps. Uh, this is, of course, still true in in a in a in a, um, in, um, in a architecture like Star Counter, but only if the other apps are not also um, using this declarative style. So if they are. We do this what we call the black hole effect. We suck everything into the single chunk and RAM, and this is the architecture. So the databases act as normal databases. If I do insert into customer or create table customer, there's going to be a table called customer. I can update it, insert, delete it. But the physical size of the database will always be zero kilobytes in size. And also, when I'm working with the with the UI, everything is in the database, including stuff that I haven't saved yet, which is not a problem because I've got transactional scope, right? So 
that acts as the form or the, the boundary. So the save is simply a commit. There's no serialization or deserialization. It's a commit. It makes it, my changes visible. And this means that I get a very interesting effect. I don't no longer need to do application level integration because it's replaced by this data level integration. So let me show you that. So in this example, I'm going to go into a simple PIM, Product Information Management System. I'm adding a product, a Fanta. I'm saving it. By running an independently, or installing an independently developed software on Star Counter, and this is the important part now. I'll pause here for a second. I can't. Something happened. Ah, keyboard stopped working. Sorry about that. So I'll do it from here instead. So what we can do with this technology is that we can virtualize the entire database. And virtualize the database means that data can be entangled such that working in one database immediately declaratively affects the other one without them being aware. And with Google's work now on web components, we have also encapsulation, not iframes, but encapsulation of, of tags, which means that it's now much safer to mix stuff on a web page. If you remember Flash, that was one of the great things. You could have these two Flash movies doing crazy stuff, and they were encapsulated, right? They didn't leak. Now, if we're doing the same thing with HTML5 and CSS, we change the header in some some component it leaks into the other one, and we go crazy, right? Now, encapsulation is back. So by combining encapsulation in web components from the work done by now by Mozilla and, and, and Chrome team, and also my Microsoft has moved on, uh, Safari is, I think, the only one lagging, we can actually also, like on a newspaper screen, we can mix stuff unknowingly using yes CSS from different sources. So we can have semantic declarative web style forms, mix, have the end user mix them together with CSS, and then it's like Lego. We can take applications. We have some guys writing Kanban and, and Gantt applications, web shops, and the whole idea is that they become each other's partners. And this is the, the reason for the title of the talk, we call it claim the piece of your piece of the trillion dollar pie. And this is what we, what we mean by this. And this is especially cool if you're working on a side project. We have one guy did a really cool application called Blunder Mail. Uh, or I'll take another example. Uh, Titut, that's peekaboo in English. Whenever you type an email address, it goes out and fix, fetches the LinkedIn profile and shows the pictures and where you work. And this means that it doesn't know about the rest of the world. This is all this application does. But if you combine it with a CRM system or a user management system or a web shop, they also have people, right? You have people in your web shop, you have people in your... So any, any other application combined with this application, you have automatic um, filling in of, of um, uh, and subscription of uh, profiles. So the whole idea is Every, everybody becomes everybody's modules. And so what our customers are doing now, they're, they're making ecosystems. Uh, there's a Russian guy doing a really cool app. It's called the Twin Assassinator. It's a very brutal world, but all it does is compares and see, you know, it sort of duplicates in my people database. He doesn't know if it's run on IKEA together with a catalog production or if it's a golf club in 
southern part of Sweden, or if it's a hospital system, you know. And so the, the, the apps can be very narrow and very specialized. And it's, you can combine them whatever way you, what, what you like. So the enterprise software is simply the case of taking apps that you like. I want the web shop. I want this web shop. I want that web shop. And in StarCraft, we have something we call wrap wraps. So you can wrap existing apps with this technology. And this means that you can pick best of breed, right? And this is what customers will demand. So, and if you're doing a point of sales, uh, uh, a retail system or a CASA, apparat, uh, post terminal, bookkeeping or product information management might be mo add on modules from other people to you. And vice versa, if you're doing a, a, a sales tool, the CASA, the point of sales, is the module. So everybody becomes everybody's piggybackers. And uh, so the takeaway is that in the future, we will no longer write business apps on bare metal. And when I, be, when I say bare metal, I mean directly on the storage mechanism. Because that makes them isolated. And isolation is fine. If you do Angry Birds and, and Spotify, you actually don't want them to mess up each other, right? If you throw an Angry Bird at the, at the pig, you don't want your playlist to be affected. But if you add a product, and then you sell it to your web shop, or you add a person and advertise on Facebook, it's got, you want it to be connected, right? If you change the price of the product, you want that to have effect. And so an information operating system is the next evolution of RAM databases, because suddenly databases can be virtualized. It's so fast that you, the database doesn't actually need architecture. There is no concept of, of, of caching or moving data or persisting data or serializing data. You do a new of a, uh, of a piece of information, it's there, and it's mappable. So, um, yeah, uh, questions? Yeah, so on top of the information operating system, yes, like on Linux and Windows, you have programming language. Unfortunately, right now, our first alpha programming language is C Sharp. The next one will be JavaScript. That will be Ruby, and then it will be Java. And the reason why we're doing Java late is because the licensing terms from Oracle is very, very harsh, and they're suing companies like Android, and, so, and we are... Uh, we have our own operating system, so we need to, we need to kidnap the heap. So when you knew an object in Java, we need to put it in the database. And Oracle is a dangerous entity to small companies like us. And Microsoft has an MIT license. So they told us, you know, rename the language if you want, it's yours. So, so that's why we, we're not doing, because of the, the, the hostile legal environment. Otherwise, Java would have been a safer choice for us because Business software is mainly done in Java. Uh, so, uh, to answer your question, the information operating system is agnostic to language, just as Linux is agnostic to language. So, this means that in this style of programming, it's a POCO, which is basically a POJO, you know, and that's your paradigm. That's why how you treat it. But in others, there's JSON, or there's SQL, or there's um, document store, or key value store. Information operating system doesn't really care. But the cool thing is that, that un unlike Linux and Windows, the, these objects are transactional. The memory is transactional. It's always in the scope. And it's always persistent. And it's always fast. So you, you actually, if you, if you want to create a, a racing car, you put it in the database. If you change the steering angle of the, of the wheel, you do it in the database. It sounds crazy, but it's, it's, there's no reason anymore to have architecture because it's the database is as fast as your memory. Why would you, why would you not do it? What if I have a racing car, but I'm not interested in it uh, as a racing car? I'm interested in it as a, an object that has weight. Uh, so, so such a good question. So how many have seen? This is the cool thing about this. How many have seen Watson? 
IBM Watson. I have to show it. Yeah. It's going to be an eye opener. I'm so happy some of you haven't seen it because it's so cool. I can still watch it, although as I've seen it a hundred times. I can still watch it just out of will. Oh, internet access. I would should have checked that first. Yep, it's here. YouTube. What's on Jeopardy? Anyone will do, I can take this one. What a wonderful If you're saving up for pension, don't go with these guys because there's no skip. <laughs> We're going to uh, treat you to uh, a short round of Jeopardy. It's going to be hosted by a member of our Jeopardy clue crew. Please welcome Jimmy McGuire. Thank you. Gentlemen. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. What do you say we play Jeopardy? All right, Let's all right. get right into the Jeopardy round. These categories, a man, a plane, a canal, Erie, Chicks Dig Me, children's book titles, My Michelle, MC5, and finally, vocabulary. Ken, you're in the first position. Please make a selection. Oh, I've never said this on TV. Chicks Dig Me for 200, please, Jimmy. <laughs> Kathleen Kenyon's excavation of this city mentioned in Joshua showed the walls had been repaired 17 times. Watson. What is Jericho? Correct. 400, same category. This mystery author and her archaeologist hubby dug in hopes of finding the lost Syrian city of Urkesh. Watson? Who is Agatha Christie? Correct. Same category, 600. At the Olduvai Gorge in 1959, she and hubby Lewis found a 1.75 million year old Australopithecus boise-eyed skull. Watson? Who is Mary Leakey? You're right. 800, same category. Harriet Boyd. So this was a kind of a big thing that has helped kickstart this new thing about cognitive computing. We long thought that, you know, this, we tried this in the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s and even 90s. And, this, uh, you know, we didn't produce anything ex exciting. But now we've, we've starting to see that, you know, the brain is just a machine. And especially for a simple case like star counter, representing information in an agnostic way, in a non-domain oriented way, is quite simple. If you have the power, it's quite simple. And uh, so the cool here thing here is that the database model that is used is unknown to the programmer. It's actually unknown to star counter as well. So star counter has a cognitive generic database. And then you install to one app that has like this barcode demo. It will create an identical database model. There will be no difference between the materialized database model and your database model. But once you install the second app, it will be the cross section of these two models. But you will not be able to see the database model. Just as we can't see what's inside our brains. And you have the third app. It's like knives going into the, the, the storage grid. And the more knives going into it, the smaller pieces are going to cut. I'll give, give you an example. I have a customer database, create table customer. And I have a create table client, Russian table. And they have first name, last name, customer number. Basically, you're going to end up with a, a storage that has these three columns very normally. But let's say you add a third app. And that allows you to have multiple customer numbers, right? Because of course, I can be a customer in this shop and in, in that, you know. Then it's going to be two tables. I might have two citizenships. So it will cognitively, you have to describe. It, it, when, when you do create table, it will actually not create the table for you. It will create a virtualized table. And then it will ask you back, what is this table describing? And this one you do without inf interfering with the application. The application only has its unit test. It only runs its unit test. Make sure that if I do an insert, I can do a read, a select. If I do delete and I do a select, it shouldn't be there. 
but the, the database model is created without you having access to it. Just like you, uh, Watson is answering your question, but you don't mess with internal structure of Watson because it, the database model becomes extremely fast, very fine-grained. So the physical object, because that was your question, me as a person here, and this has been shown in the brain, this is called something called uh, scare, sparse distribution representation. In the brain, the key for a person is not a symbol. In ASCII, for instance, 65 means A. In the brain, it's a bitmap and it's almost all zeros. There's one bit saying, I hear I'm a physical object. There's one bit here saying I'm a life form. There's one thing here saying I'm a speaker. So the key, the symbol, is com uh, composed. And when we, sh we saw this in brains, we went, oh fuck, this is so simple. It's so simple. That's why I can say like, here's a car, here's a bird. Now I'm gonna say there's a flubby blub, and a fabric blob is a car with wings. And you can all, every here, everybody here can say, what happens when a flabby bob in the air stops flapping? Come on, give me an answer. What happens? It falls. It falls down. So we can easily combine anything with anything. Our brains are working in this way. This is why object orientation with the inheritance is such an oversimplification of how knowledge is organized. That's why the Java people, JavaScript people don't like inheritance because actually they're wrong, it's not needed, but generalization in the brain is so much powerful than generalization using inheritance. And to program using this is too hard because it comes too fragmented, it's like sand. You have to leave that to a reasoning engine. But, but you still have to do the description. That way yes. And how yes. do you do that? Uh, currently, there's three ways to do it. Uh, or there's actually two ways to do it currently. Uh, we're working on the third one. The first way to do it is you create your app, you submit it to a where app warehouse, and then somebody maps it. Because you, you, want, you might want to map, correct the mapping when you're running with other apps. Because for instance, when you add something that happens in time, it's probably going to show up in the calendar application. Maybe you don't want that. So you're going to re-describe at, 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 at the last mile when you're combining the apps. Because this description, as you saw in the code, this code here, it doesn't really care what's an invoice. I describe it outside the system. Um, um, the second way to do it is that you describe it using, it's, it's related to natural language. You say simply that this is a first name, and then um, you search for the term first name, and then you use a vocabulary like say, like a, a customer's name is the name of the person, um, and then it uh, interprets it in that way. The third way of doing it, which we're working on now, is to use Watson. So you, go, you get asked back. I don't understand this. You know, you're, you're saying here that you have something called Oracle. Is it the database or the company? And then you have to ask, answer the questions. And uh, so the cool thing about the cognitive thing is very, it's, 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 it's kind of natural. And, and as you, you don't describe stuff that is obvious. Then only if it's wrong. I'm typing in the, the, the article number here. It's not showing up there. Then you, then you describe further. You know, I, actually these two should be the same. But you don't actually tell the applications. There are applications in Star Counter actually have a firewall between them. It's illegal in Star Counter to have an API call between applications because that builds dependencies. And if you want true composability, the end user wants to be able to pick stuff from your app store. So our customers are now building their own app stores. They're not, we are not creating an app store because we want, if Wisma, for instance, they're not the customer, if they want to build an ecosystem, they choose, like Apple, what apps to bring into the ecosystem. If you guys create an ecosystem, you decide, because you fought hard for your customers, you don't want anybody, you don't want like, like on Salesforce or SAP, that you build the app, but it's on their ecosystem. So then they, if you're successful, they are gonna incorporate it. So our customers are building their own ecosystems. We're just technology for, 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 for them. So, so to answer the question is uh, that, that mapping can be done, you can ignore map, um, in this way, and this is how we make money also, is if you create an app and you sell it, we like MySQL. It's your app, it's your customer. But if you submit it to our warehouse, you can get a reseller in, in Singapore. 
or in, in um, like, like this for these guys doing the T2, this peekaboo. Everybody wants to peekaboo, you know, because it's just a cool feature. It's just you enter an email address and boom, pops pop up the picture of the person. It doesn't matter what's the system. So th the peekaboo actually goes into all these app stores now because it helps them sell their system. And then whenever peekaboo is sold, they get their money, we get our money, and the seller gets the money. So that's ho how we make money. Uh, so we only get money if this crazy stuff works. If the crazy stuff doesn't work, you have SAP HANA for free. You have an enterprise level ACID SQL RAM database, ideal for business software for free. Because we're so confident in that the cool thing here is composability. Lego. Uh, so, so, um, uh, so, w and uh, anything you put on the app, app warehouse, we promise to show it to everybody else so they can resell it, and we map it. And we, we are going to be the Watson, so we're going to, because each app has a very simplified data model, because you don't need to create crazy normalized databases, because you have, you compose things of small apps, and the, if you do a, a CASA or a point of sales, you make that app have a, a, a naive data model for just that purpose, which means that uh, mapping can be done by the user not the developer. Any more questions? Because I think we ran out, ran out of... I have a few time. more, but does anyone else? Uh, we yeah, sure. We, uh, of course. Uh, okay. so I thank you so much for your, for your, yeah. for your attention. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.